what I'd like to do is just talk you a little bit through our experience, uh, my university's first experience in doing the MOOC, and also my own personal experience, first experience in doing my first MOOC. So, why do a robotics MOOC? You've probably been discussing this all day, I'm not going to belabor the point. Uh, the traditional university economic model is creaking uh, and groaning, it's not going to last. Technology uh, has changed radically. And I think there's now a real appetite amongst younger people to get their learning in smaller, more modular components. They don't want to knuckle down for a two-year or three-year course. They just want to learn a thing because that's important at their point in career that they, that they have this particular skill or thing. Uh, from my own perspective, uh, it's probably a, a little bit of egomania and I decided a while ago that I wanted to teach robotics to the world. Uh, and I have you know, some open source software which has been used by people for teaching for more than 20 years. I wrote a textbook which, is, which sells really well, but there's kind of quite an indirect relationship with the people that I'm trying to, that I'm trying to teach or reach. Uh, my teaching at the moment uh, is done in a class of 80 students a year. That's how much I can teach. So in a sort of travel metaphor, I'm teaching a bus full of people and they're local people, uh, it's the reach of a bus, uh, and that's what I can do. Seven billion people on the planet, 80 a year, it's gonna take me a long time to reach them all. So we need another uh, modality. I'm not gonna belabor the metaphor too much, but you know, we need to have global reach, and we need to be able to reach a very, very large number of people. So that's, uh, that's how we got into this whole MOOC thing. Uh, I had uh, a little bit of experience with just putting some of my lectures up on, up on YouTube and I didn't advertise them or anything like that, but they've been ridiculously popular uh, just, from, just from word of mouth. And I sense that there was a real appetite for undergraduate level <coughs> content in robotics, which is, which is my field. There's a lot of hobby hacker stuff out there about <coughs> robotics, but a lot of it's not very principled uh, and it's not <coughs> it's not particularly credible. And so what I'm trying to do is to address this undergraduate, uh, undergraduate space. So yeah, we built a MOOC, we built the whole infrastructure around the MOOC uh, in a period of just two years. And we ran two MOOCs. Uh, uh, one's called Introduction to Robotics, and that ran uh, February, March, April. And one at the moment, the Robotic Vision MOOC, is currently in week six. Uh, so we uh, started developing the content a long time before we had a, a platform or a vendor and we got incredibly nervous as we had more and more uh, assets in the bank uh, and no way to get them out to the world. Uh, and we discovered Edcast and we worked really, really well with, uh, with them to uh, take uh, what we've done and, and help us deliver it to, to the world. Motivation for my university, one of the, the big pluses for going Edcast is there's no IP complications, we own all of the IP, and also the branding is uncomplex. The brand is ours, uh, which is not the case with some other uh, MOOC providers. So a thing that was really important to us when we put the course together was we wanted really, really high production value. So these are just some frames uh, out of some of the MOOCs. So we wanted some really clear and powerful graphics. There are lots of animations that we use, and I work with a wonderful team of graphic designers. Uh, it's not all narrated keynote presentations. Sometimes there's, there's me on a, you know, in a science museum trying to demonstrate a particular concept. I'm waving my hands and using artifacts at, a, at the table in my office. There's a bit of historical stuff. Uh, there's bits of whimsy. Uh, I think that's important, teaching and engaging the students and uh, it appeals to them. Uh, you know, the, the things that just illustrate important points but with powerful graphics I think is a really good way to attract and hold the uh, student's attention. An example of me in my office trying to demonstrate a, a particular concept uh, with a robot and a, and a banana. And, and I use also use some screencasts. So we use uh, some mathematical software called MATLAB and that's kind of the one of the, the language of instruction in this particular course. So I have screencast as well, so the students can see me using MATLAB and how I use MATLAB to generate particular results and solve problems. We also use MATLAB as a way for students to express their solutions to problems. So I pitch them a problem and they have to express that in terms of valid MATLAB code, which we can automatically grade in order to give the students their results. Uh, some other frames from the, from the course. Uh, that's a snapshot, you've probably seen this before. More, just 
quickly whiz through some of these some of these different graphics. So the assessments, as I mentioned before, there are the MATLAB assignments that counts for half the grade, and there are also multi-choice questions uh, count for the other half the grade. So every week we have two lectures, and we have some MATLAB assignments and some multi-choice questions. Well, uh, what have I learned out of all this? Uh, I've learned an awful lot. I don't think I would have done a MOOC if I if I know what I know now. Uh, uh, but, now, but now, I will I, I plan to at least do two more, but uh, at the time, I, I had no idea that what a time sink this thing would be when I, when I started. Uh, like, I, I did all the lectures and I thought I was done, and they say, ah, now we've got the assessments, and there's this, there's always another thing that needs to be, that needs to be produced. But I think I've learned that it's certainly possible we can, we can obtain global reach from a small university in Brisbane. It actually doesn't matter uh, where you are. And uh, at the conference I was at last week, I met a bunch of my students for the first time. So we went and had some beers one night. It was wonderful. Uh, so that, that, was, that was great. Uh, and you know, we've learned, we've got the systems in place, and my university is going to do some more MOOCs. Uh, so that's some of the things that we learned. We certainly had global reach. Our biggest cohort was in India. I mean, India is a, is a, is a country uh, that has uh, you know, got a really good education system, very, very strong in computer science. Uh, not so strong in robotics, but to you know, segue from CS into robotics, uh, I think with you know, material like this, it certainly resonated in India. The US was a big cohort, as was Australia. We don't have very much solid information on where the students come from. This is a traffic survey from early on. Uh, but we can see Egypt was a big cohort. Uh, various European countries through South America. I know we have some students in Rwanda, uh, you know, which is a very small and very impoverished country. Uh, so it's wonderful to have that kind of reach. Uh, we did a couple of marketing campaigns, and this was initially our, our rate. When I started, I, I thought I'd be happy if I had 100 students. That was, that was going to be awesome. So we started a viral campaign through a few kinds of media channels that robotics people use, and the you know, slope was, was pretty low at the beginning. And then we did this thing called Science Alert on Facebook, and uh, we got in front of two million faces. Uh, I think in a weekend we had tens of thousands of likes and re-forwards, and, and that's the big spike uh, that you see on the, on the first MOOC that we, that we ran. You can see another spike on the, on the lower curve. That's when we ran a Facebook campaign for our second, our second course, uh, which also caused a bit of a bump in our first course, which is unfortunate because that course was in its last week. And so we've had to push those, came to rerun that course and push those uh, new enrollees into the second running of our first course, if that, if that makes sense. But it's interesting, the continual growth in enrollment in the course, even after it started. And so, and I think that does be sort of word of, word of mouth effect as people discover the course and, uh, and enroll. So big conversation for us at the moment is whether we move this course into an asynchronous mode. Uh, at the moment this is synchronous. We release material every week. We have a team of tutors who are assigned uh, to man the discussion forums, uh, in, in, you know, answer questions where, where need be and uh, eliminate stupidity where it arises so it doesn't propagate through the student cohort. Uh, we had a project uh, in this which is perhaps a little unusual and we challenged the students to build a robot. So we provided a specification for the robot and we put in place a peer review process and that worked really well. Uh, we didn't get that many robots submitted, I think it was around 30, but the students could use whatever technology was available to them and they made a YouTube video of their robot doing the task, they submitted that to us and they agreed in doing that to peer review three other robots. And so we created a rubric and the students literally evaluated each other's robots. And we then made a mashup reel of all of the robots that were submitted to us and then gave it back to the class. And uh, it was really, really popular thing within the class. So I think what it's done is opened the eyes to a lot of people who said, it's too hard to build a robot. I think the next time we run this, I believe we'll get a lot more students uh, building robots. So this is wonderful. Someone who's perhaps never ever built a robot before, realize that with pretty commonplace technology, you can build a robot. So I keep saying to my university, why do we have labs anymore? No, we don't need a robotics lab. Or we give every student a Lego kit, and they can have a lab in their home, in their bedroom, in their dorm room. 
So the idea of computer labs and robotics labs and electronic labs in general, I think, is actually now very, very old-fashioned. Uh, we, our TAs were pretty active in trying to tweak the interest of the community. So as well as just answering questions, they were quite proactive in feeding things out to the community. Hey, here's a cool thing. Here's a conference. You know, here's a, here's a nice YouTube video. As a, as a way of just engaging with them and trying to build some kind of rapport. And you know, the students uh, who, were, who were the TAs were really, were really good in this way. This is the motivations that the people said up front that there was their motivation to do the MOOC uh, was just general interest or a professional interest. Uh, and I think that, that's really good. Their age. The students in this MOOC, I think, were pretty young. There was a big chunk between 10 and 20, that's the blue, and a really big chunk between 20 and 30, which is kind of like your undergraduate age group. So these are not sort of professional people or retired people thinking robots are cool. These are quite young people. Uh, and that, to me, I'm actually a little bit worried about the very young ones doing this because this course is an undergraduate level course. You need to know math. You need to know about Laplace transforms and linear algebra. So I, don't, I have got no data about how well the youngest people in this cohort fared. Uh, and I would really, really like to know that, but I don't have that information. Uh, gender, uh, sadly very skewed towards males, but uh, that's my life, teaching engineering uh, and computer science. Uh, there's nothing unusual there. Uh, education attainment, I think, is also quite surprising. There is a big chunk who are high school only, uh, and another big chunk who just have uh, uh, their, their first, working on their first degree. Uh, previous MOOC participation, uh, also I was surprised that it was so low. I understand that there is lots of young people today who have you know, done like, tens of MOOCs. Uh, and I thought that this would just be another notch on their belt. There seemed to be a lot of first-time MOOC people uh, in, in here. Uh, what else do we know? Uh, this is some feedback about what people thought about the course materials. So the course materials, there was uh, various aspects of this, the software that they used, uh, the book, the textbook that they use. Uh, we use Google Hangouts to communicate with the crowd. We also used email and discussion forums. So we've got feedback on these various elements. What's most pleasing to me is they really love the, uh, the video lectures. So that makes me personally very, very happy. Uh, feedback after the course, uh, again, on the course overall. I'm again very happy that it was skewed so far to the, to the right. There were some very outspoken Grinches in the course, uh, too, who I won't name. Uh, they sort of provided some, some entertainment, but they also acted a little bit corrosive in the community, and we had to flag them a lot uh, to uh, suppress them. Uh, some nice comments from people all around the world. Uh, and some of them, uh, and maybe these ones aren't here, are very touching, uh, particularly for people uh, in Africa and South America who say that the opportunity for them to go to university is very, very limited. And even if they did go to university, the chance of them getting the university that, that taught robotics would be almost zero. Uh, so these people were really stoked that they could do that. Uh, I guess my fear is, you know, what happens to them next? So maybe I've tweaked their interest. Uh, what, ha what happens to them next? Uh, so where to from here? Uh, the experience from my whole university has been really positive. So we're starting to do more MOOCs so in a completely different topic area. There's a MOOC being developed now that will go out on EdCast. We're very interested in the corporate ed market and we're starting to talk about how we bend this content into a format that will work for the corporate sector. Uh, maybe that involves monetization. Uh, this is just an ongoing discussion at the, at the moment. So certainly positive experience all around. I'm motivated to do more. The university's motivated to do more. Uh, so yeah, watch this space. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a very entertaining presentation. Uh, I love the idea in theory of not needing labs, mm -hmm. and letting the students make their own lab. That brings to my mind the question of equity and access to quality, especially the more distributed worldwide, where you cannot even find the Lego yes. kit for sale. So how do you 
what, what ideas did you get from the participants about ways of getting around that kind of a challenge? It's a really good question. It's one that, that, that bothered us as we were putting this together. So we, at my university, we teach using Lego. So we, we give our students Lego kits. Uh, you know, we're a, a wealthy developed country and we can afford to do that. Uh, and students who are doing the MOOC in Western countries could afford to buy Lego kits and set you back a couple of hundred bucks. But in Indian Africa, it's absolutely, it's not tenable. So when we, we specified the task, we showed how it could be done with Lego. So one of the TAs week by week showed how you would construct the, the, the robot out of Lego. But we weren't pres being prescriptive in saying you have to use Lego, but if you did use Lego, this is what the solution would look like. But there were some other technologies that you could use that were lower cost. So there, were some, there was a social group form to try and build a very low cost robot. And they were looking for the, you know, the, the cheapest motors that they could get uh, on the internet, our little servo motors that you use in airplanes and, and Arduinos and things like that. They could probably build a robot for 50 bucks, which is probably still pretty steep. Uh, but maybe there's an opportunity for somebody to, to step in and perhaps at volume, I mean, we had a, many, many thousands of students, so maybe uh, we could approach some manufacturer to produce a kit that we could sell for a very small amount of dollars. Uh, maybe you could get something like a foundation, maybe you would get behind that and, and drive the price down, price down either fur even further. With all of these things, it's all about volume, so if we get the volume up, we could probably get the kit price down and that would be, would be nice. Uh, I have a dream about a future edition of my book, of my textbook, where in the back of the book there's like a press-out robot. Like you used to get in serial packets, yeah? So you go to the last page of the book, you rip it out, you press it, press it out, and then, uh, and then you communicate with it from your, from your laptop. It's a good question, thank you. Yeah? How likely you can make the your classroom a still kind of structure that time frame to a completely self-paced class? Is it possible? I think you'd use them for different purposes. The, the self-paced one, the asynchronous m mode, I, I see its main value would be for academics around the world who wanted to use it in a blended learning format. So it, it would be paced by that particular academic. You know, the, the particular dates that we released our MOOC for, don't, they won't fit the academic calendar for every country on the planet. Uh, they, they work for us. Uh, so I think if we want it to be used in a blended way, we need to, we need to go asynchronous. But I think we will still offer a couple of synchronous versions of the course per year, and we will schedule tutors uh, for those. But we wouldn't put tutors on the asynchronous one. Uh, 